Okay, so the webinar is now live um, and we are now recording to all of our panellists. Um, we will typically leave a 30 second sort of gap now whilst we allow people to come on board and to join. So the participants are joining us now. So thank you very much to all of those joining us this morning. Uh, and I am now going to share my screen, which hopefully all of you will be able to see. Yes. Perfect. And then when we're ready, we will crack on. So massive thank you to everybody for joining us this morning um, for um, what feels like actually a very um, speedy month from our last panel through to this one. Uh, so this is our October panel monthly series for HR leaders across the globe. Um, with a particular focus this time on turning the dial on diversity and building inclusive workforces. Um, so thank you very much. I'm going to start um, by introducing our panel because actually we have got a cracking panel um, for this particular webinar and I'm really excited by the people who are, who are joining us. Uh, so I'm going to start with uh, Colin, Colin Campbell Austin, who um, is inclusion and diversity leader at Channel 4. Um, he worked at Channel 4 previously and actually has been back and, and joined just eight weeks ago um, in this role, uh, having previously founded a business that focused on inclusion and mental health and mental. Um, Colin is passionate about inclusion, talent, people de development, um, but also thinks outside the box to create innovative, exciting new concepts and ways of working. Um, I'm going to spin off some accolades about Colin. So 65th on the Pride Power list published in The Guardian, June 2016, highly commended at the European Diversity Awards in 2014 and 2015. Winner of Out in the City um, Readers Awards for LGBT Diversity Champion. Um, so we're, we're genuinely really excited to have Colin on the panel. So thank you, Colin. Thank you. Uh, next, I'm going to go to Peter. I've known Peter for a, lo a long time. Peter I, is someone who I consider a friend as much as a business contact. So Peter, thank you for joining us this morning. Peter is Head of Diversity and Inclusion at Royal Mail, um, having spent time actually in a number of interim roles fo focusing on inclusion and diversity. Um, and interestingly, one of those um, included working with an organisation called the Employers Network for Equality and Inclusion, which I think will bring a really interesting insight to today's conversation. He is um, the most delivery focused and commercially driven diversity and inclusion executive I have met. Um, so there is an accolade for the others to, to kind of rise up to. Um, business led, practical, hands on and a highly successful track record. So um, Peter, thank you. I forgot to put your picture up. So you may have to, there we are. That's Peter for those who, who um, missed him. So forgive me, Peter. Uh, next, Tali Shlomo. Um, Atali is Interim Head of Inclusion and Wellbeing at Shearman and Sterling, which um, in her own words is an, a lovely organisation to work for. Um, she previously spent 20 years uh, at the Chartered Insurance Institute, um, the last 12 of which was Global People Engagement Director, internationally recognised HR Director for Diversity and Inclusion and Wellbeing as a thought leader. Um, some more accolades. So achievements in the 2020 Insurance Business Global 100 Influential People Creating inclusion, Inclusive Workplace Cultures. Shortlisted in the Women in Finance Awards 2020 Ambassador of the Year. Um, highly commended in the Financial Advisor Diversity in Finance Awards. So an acknowledged DNI specialist um, and a regular spokesperson at events and panel sessions. So Tali, thank you so much for your time and for joining us. Um, last but absolutely by no means least, let me um, move to Olivia Stone. So Tucker Stone are our partners in, in these webinars. We really want to make sure that we are going out to clients, prospects and candidates with information in this slightly random world that we're living in at the moment. Um, Tucker Stone are a boutique HR and change search consultancy. Uh, established over 10 years ago, uh, deliver actually across a broad section of organisations from startups to FTSE 50 businesses, uh, both permanent and interim roles in the HR space. And Olivia specialises in CPO roles with a particular interest in inclusion and diversity. So Olivia, many thanks for joining us. We really appreciate it. Um, and uh, then uh, a little bit about me. So my name is Alison Ettridge. I am chief believer of a business um, called Talent Intuition. And you'll hear me talking about this all the time, but I'm chief believer because I fundamentally believe that 
big data and analysis can help organizations to make better informed decisions. And I am uh, on, on a crusade to help organizations make better informed decisions, particularly around managing their skills supply chain, optimizing where they have people, um, or more laterally informing diversity. Uh, how do clients engage with us? So clients buy um, Stratagems, which is a big data platform uh, that looks at the external world to answer internal questions. Uh, and we believe that when it comes to diversity, it's important to employ facts, not fiction. Um, uh, and then we also um, overlay a number of those projects with qualitative research from the marketplace. Thank you to everybody for their questions uh, sent to us beforehand. We always get them the night before, which is slightly distressing. Um, and then we try and bunch them up into a whole list of questions um, and topics. So uh, today we're going to look at, first of all, what's the challenge? Why now? Um, and what is the challenge that we're all facing in inclusion and diversity? Uh, then we'll focus on how do we get our leaders to buy into this and understand that actually this is about business performance um, and building better places for people to work as much as it is about um, ticking a box. So forgive me for using that terminology. Um, then take action. So you know, we, we're joined by some great practitioners and leaders um, today. So actually, what are the simple steps? What are the things that we could do in order to make a difference in our organisations right now? Um, we will then talk about how we can use data to make better informed decisions, particularly around diversity. Uh, and then with luck, um, and if I am better at managing time than normal, we will get to our top tips summary um, from all of our panel members. So thank you. Thank you for allowing us the time um, to do the introduction. Um, I just thought that I'd do a quick positioning um, in the why now and what is the challenge that we face. Um, this is a bit of research that we um, did actually on behalf of a Fortune 500 client uh, and we looked at 22 of their nearest competitors um, and the largest advertisers in the US and the UK because that was important to their business. Um, and I think this was all around what positive act action are organisations taking. And interestingly, 64% uh, of organisations take positive action to increase female representation across their business. But only 5% of organisations took positive action to promote persons of colour and to improve and drive performance from persons of colour. And yet 50% in the wake of Black Lives Matter made a substantial donation <laughs> to organisations that were outside of their sphere. And actually, if we look in the context of Black Lives Matter, these organisations have responded by posting messages of support on corporate websites, some have made big donations, but actually social media responses, I did a quick Google on some social media responses, have had, thanks for your messages of support, now please send me an image of your exec team. Um, which I think is quite interesting because that response demonstrates that what people really want to see now more than ever is action and not deliberation. Uh, this is a quote from um, actually someone who joined us on a panel um, a few weeks ago. So we feel united around a purpose, um, but how do we make sure that we keep that unity and that we hold people accountable as we move forward? That's enough of the sound of my voice. So um, panelists, every time you see a screen that's got your photos on, that's kind of the, the nudge that we're, we're, we're gonna to come to you. Um, and I think we have some really interesting um, questions in this section, not least in the UK is racism or sexism our biggest challenge from a diversity perspective. Uh, and I wanted to um, go to Olivia for this one first, because I think you have a really interesting outside in broad organization view. Uh, thanks, Ali. Um, I think your slides um, say a lot, you know, in terms of action taken for uh, the, the sexism, the gender uh, conversation. Um, not enough has been taken any, anywhere else, actually. So I think it's too binary to say it's one or other of those two areas of diversity. I think we need uh, to be looking at all areas um, uh, of diversity and inclusion. Um, and be worried about all of it. 
actually. Um, I think everyone uh, concentrates on the gender question because it's easier uh, mm -hmm. to talk about that. It's something that um, it has been spoken about for a long time and people feel less scared of that than they do. There's huge amounts of fear um, around the topic of diversity and inclusion and people are worried about what they're gonna say and how they're gonna say it. Um, from our perspective, um, what we see, um, and, and we are lucky enough to be you know, uh, partners with the HR community. So HR is informed. We already know how important it is, how we get it out into the business and how we get the business to take ownership and understand it is a discussion we shall be having, I expect, over the next hour. But we are lucky enough to work with uh, HR leaders who already know how important this is. Um, and so we don't come up uh, you know, against any uh, uh, areas particularly to, to, to worry about. Everyone thinks about it all the time from an HR and from a search perspective, a recruitment perspective. What I see um, most visibly um, is how easy it is to discriminate casually, really quickly, on a CV um, with regards to education and age. It, it's just done almost, you know, people flick to the back of the CV and they have a look at uh, education, which, you know, speaks of uh, certain potential advantages or disadvantages people may have had or traditional or non-traditional backgrounds um, and how long they have been working for. And it's something that people do completely unconsciously. I mean, obviously it's less, of, I'm doing some paper motions now as I flick through CVs. They're online now most of the time, people don't print them off as much, but the concept is still there. And it's just done uh, without people even realizing it. And it's still a habit. So uh, in answer to your question, I think that um, you know, your figures point to where we need to work, but they don't represent all the other areas of uh, diversity and inclusion that we need to think about. Um, but there are other things that people, you know, we just discriminate. Uh, unconsciously, un unaware all the time. We're constantly making comparisons um, and it's just something we all need to be aware of. And I think that's really interesting because actually that almost kind of ties into one of the other questions, which is um, what's the role of power um, in diversity and inclusion? Tali, do you want to um, uh, touch on some of the things Olivia have said? Oh, I'd love to build on that. Um, I think there's so much in that, you know, just if we touch on the recruitment piece, um, looking at through CVs, just by looking at someone's name. And I know so many organizations need blind CVs, but at some point you'll see somebody's name. So the bias kicks in, might not be on stage one, it might be on right at the latter end. Um, and it's all about bias. And one of the things we don't really talk about a great deal is people with disabilities. Mm -hmm. And particularly COVID and the pandemic has amplified so many elements of bias, ethnicity bias, age bias, um, and also, well-being and the impact of mental health that also has from an inclusion and diversity perspective so building on some of that is how do we create that inclusion inclusion piece but first of all identifying what is diversity because we all talk about diversity and inclusion how often do we define what is diversity and then what is inclusion and i think that definition is so important for organizations when you start to develop not only your strategy, but your framework to delivery. And I know we'll be talking about data, which is absolutely fundamental. So just to reframe for anyone on the call, diversity for me is always about the representation within your organization. And all of our organizations, we lead people, whether we are a tech business, whether we, we are uh, an organization building products, we are leading people. And having a diverse representation that represents the society that we live in because we're all here for our consumers whoever our consumers are and then the inclusion piece is about bringing your best authentic self because by doing that guess what happens you you really are then have a clear purpose to deliver meaningful work and meaningful work only improves the engagement only improves the outcomes only improves the business strategy and the deliverables around that so to answer your question about the power of diversity, a lot of that for me is around allyship. The role of allies is so important. Um, but I think fundamentally before we start any of that is the engagement piece, the learning, stepping into somebody else's lived experience so that we can feel that moment in time and what impact does it have. Yeah, I love that. Peter, you, you've come off mute, which implies you, 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 you can build on the conversation. Yeah, I... Um... 
agree with everything that's, that's been said when it comes to diversity, it is the people in the room. Uh, inclusion to me is obviously allowing them a voice, but it's allowing everybody a voice and creating that inclusive environment is the most important thing. We, we work incredibly hard to bring a diverse group of individuals into an organization, but it's very easy to alienate them if we don't allow them to actively participate in, in what's going on in their decision making, allowing their voices to be heard. And uh, the reason I sort of I jumped on and, and took myself off mute was it's not just about how you look. It's, it's very easy for people to say, well, show is your executive board. But yeah, that, that's, that, that's fantastic. But um, I've seen executive boards look amazing. I, I, I won't name them, but, uh, but certainly one of the big four has the most diverse group of individuals to look at but I know full well that eight out of nine of them went to the same school uh, they all they all come from the similar background it's just it, it's very easy to get caught up in though we should be looking at the numbers but you need to think about the underlying cognitive diversity because if you really want to harness the power of the individuals that you bring in you need to make sure you're covering as many of the bases as possible as opposed to just ticking a box to go back to your phrase Ali yeah, I completely agree. And I, I know Colin um, on on Colin's LinkedIn profile. So Colin, uh, forgive me for stalking you slightly, uh, but you talk about diversity of thought, experience, and opinion will always produce better outputs, better results, better products, and better services. Uh, absolutely. I mean, the more people you've got around the table contributing to a project, you know, the better the outcomes going to be. When I used to work at the Telegraph, um, I introduced a um, uh, apprenticeship um, program for them and you know the aim of that was to bring in um, individuals that were you know very different um, from what were coming through the graduate program and one of the examples that um, I always used was that you know if they were doing a, if the magazine was doing an article on um, say a, a cup or crockery um, yes you could do an article on how beautiful it is and how it's you know it's butchers made etc etc but if you've got somebody around the table that actually grew up in that village where that factory is um, there's a much richer story there that can be had so you can still have the the um, piece around round cups and how beautiful they are and where you can buy them from but also then you can enhance that by talking about how that cup is, is made, how it supports um, that village, um, how it's been there for X amount of time. The more people we have around the table, the richer the content becomes, especially in media, that's absolutely um, you know, what we want. Um, so just going back to the point around um, inclusion, um, for me, inclusion is about everybody. Um, it's about everyone being focused on what it is that the company wants to do and what it wants to achieve and how we're all going to get there together. For me, diversity has become a bit of a, um, it's a word that actually can cause divide because when you use the word diversity, you automatically think of uh, people of colour, sexuality, um, etc. But what about the rest of the workforce as well? You know, what about the, um, the, the white 40 year old men that have been there for, for a long time? You can't exclude people from this journey. You've got to take everybody on it. So I think inclusion is, is, is really, really important. And when it comes to biases, if we, if we keep creating these divides, those biases are just going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. Actually, it's about bringing everyone together, working together and ensuring that everybody actually has a voice and everybody actually feels that they are part of something, not just someone that, you know, is, is, is one of those characteristics that, that form a diverse person. It's about everybody. If we don't take everybody on that journey and everyone doesn't feel part of it, anyone that comes into that organisation isn't going to feel part of it either. So actually it's about creating that inclusion first. Yes, absolutely, bringing in people from wherever, this, you know, whatever their background is, it's about what they can contribute to the business. But actually if the inclusion piece isn't there first, then diversity sits on the side and people coming in will not feel included. Yeah, that, and, and you know, you've said so many things there that are really interesting, but I, I, I need to move us on, um, otherwise I should be in trouble before we've even, before we've even uh, really got into the nitty gritty. But um, actually, you, you, you've led quite nicely into leadership behaviours and, and how we um, drive leadership behaviours, because clearly that is what's going to build an inclusive environment. Um, I wanted to just... Um, uh, pop another interesting factor on. So I ran a search, I just ran this search last night um, uh, from Strategens, and this is a search on 
diversity and inclusion um, professionals in the UK. And I just thought it was quite interesting that 36% of professionals in the UK who are in a diversity and inclusion lead or inclusion and diversity, depending on, on, on who they're working for, were male. 53% um, were female. The difference is people where we, we the, the algorithms haven't been able to work it out. Um, uh, and 90% of those people were white. So I just, I think it's quite interesting that when we talk about inclusion, you're right, Colin, we need to talk about inclusive cultures. But actually, this is this is the background that we are working with. And therefore, we need to make sure that we can bring all of these people on a journey, um, particularly from a leadership point of view. Um, so let's let's talk about that. What, what's kind of the if yeah, we've got a bunch of leaders and this this is new and scary people, right, to touch on Olivia's point earlier. This is something that is scary for leaders to talk about. Um, what's the best way to kind of build advocacy for change in the leadership population? Um, I'm happy to have a go at that one, Ali. Like, the, it, it, there's never an easy answer to this, but the, the way I've always viewed it is people who take an interest or want to do something about this do it for one of three reasons. Either they're scared of being wrapped over the knuckles, so they want to obey the law, the law of the land. Others see it as the right thing to do, and others will look at it as a, a business imperative and say, we will be more productive, more profitable as we go from this. Now, uh, all of those are obviously true, and all of those will happen whether you want them to or not. It's always going to be the right thing to do, and your business will be more effective. And the reason why I frame it in that particular way is there is always a hook for somebody somebody will say oh I've suddenly become concerned about what my daughter's job prospects are going to be in the workplace or whatever it might be it makes it sort of slightly personal but from a business leadership perspective it's uh, it's quite strange because I work for Royal Mail and a lot of the times I've done this um, I really focus on the increased business performance where that was very much a, a sort of a dirty word no, no 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 it's the right thing to do we, we, we just really should do it because of that and it's only when we got under under the skin of that and saying, actually, it's not a dirty word. We can be more effective. We can, we can do this. That we start to engage the leadership population. And where, where I've ended up with doing this now is um, uh, they're very effective. They, they, they do listen. So I actually report to the executive board. I go to each executive board meeting. That's why I'm wearing a suit for the first time in at least seven months. I've got to go to one later. And uh, that way, the entire leadership of, of Royal Mail is engaged in, in this particular part. And that's a quite a long-winded way of saying you need somebody who's incredibly visible. In my case, I'm lucky enough to have the chief executive, but you need somebody who's incredibly visible to say this is important otherwise it is going to take you a very long time to turn the tide so actually yeah i think there's something quite interesting here about attempting to solve systemic problems is is a long haul right so it takes financial and and human resources uh, how do you get that visible person to come on the journey tally engagement so uh, peter everything that you've said i would echo entirely business performance, we mustn't be scared, you know, it comes back to linking to cognitive thinking, diverse thinking. We, there's so much data, there's so much evidence that clearly indicates the performance impact. The way we look at PNL, let's look at DNI in the same way. Let's bring it to the top table all the time in every conversation. And the engagement is absolutely fundamental. So not only should the leadership team or the board or your exco be involved, but also having executive sponsors who find there's a hook for them that personally they want to lean into the conversation because when you lean into a conversation and you have that aha moment you start to make a positive difference and we've we've mentioned inclusive cultures several times what is culture culture is all about behaviors and how do we create that how do we create that inclusion having a voice at the table it could be the most simplest thing you know when you have a team uh, meeting how often do we invite everyone around the table to have a voice? And it could be that small nudge. And it's the same at the top table, all the way through the organization. So having those engagement moments are fundamental, but always hooking back to the business impact and the performance measures. Because if we lose sight of that, what we tend to do is we move back into just operational, tactical, short-term solutions. And this is about sustainable outcomes that we can always evolve like we do with our business strategy. Yeah, I, I think that's fascinating. So, you know, I talk about being chief believer all the time, but actually this kind of concept of the way that we manage our people, if we managed our finances, 
in the same way that we managed our people. All of our businesses would have been belly up a long time ago. Um, but there's something about the way that we manage people and, and um, the diversity and, and, and how that drives you know, fundamentally better business performance, actually, as well as better places to work um, that we shy away from. And, Olivia, what do you see across your clients? Um, I was, uh, it's great that, that Peter's in there in, in every, uh, in many exec meetings and having that voice and having that sponsor and CEO, I mean, it, it cannot, nothing can be done without uh, being in that room. What I see is not enough um, uh, uh, HR functions have a senior enough DNI specialist, if indeed they have a DNI specialist, uh, on their own leadership team, let alone in that top room. Um, so uh, the role of, of, of HR is exceptionally difficult um, because, of course, we're asking everybody to be better at their job and better people and better leaders, and that's the only way we can succeed. DNI has that doubly. Every every uh, subject matter expert in DNI needs to be um, in every resourcing conversation, in every performance conversation, in every uh, you know policy conversation, so that their the DNI strategy is the people strategy. It's part and parcel of every conversation that happens within the HR function. So it doesn't feel like it's an issue on its own. It has to be in that built into the culture, A, of the HR function, the people team, and then uh, that needs to be right in there along with finance, along with marketing, along with operations. So it doesn't feel like it's an added conversation. It is the conversation. Yeah, we, we, fund, we talk a lot about joining the dots um, for exactly that reason. You've got a diversity dot, you've got a people dot, you've got a talent acquisition dot, you've then got a transformation dot, a real estate dot, a location dot, yeah, and, and actually you need to bring all of those dots together, um, whatever, whatever business challenge it is that you're trying to solve. Colin, we've got a question in, um, in the Q&A that I'd like to point to you, actually, which I think is quite interesting. So um, I was about to say thank you to the person, but they've come, they've posed the question anonymously. So thank you, anonymous attendee is what I've got a choice of saying. Um, the, the culture of any organisation is shaped by the worst behaviour the leader is willing to tolerate. If your organisation needs blind CVs, when is it time to dismiss managers who still discriminate? The presumption is that they, uh, they have all had training, etc. Um, can I throw that one at you? Because I think it's quite um, interesting. I absolutely agree. Couldn't agree more. Um, you know, we can do all of these things, but if we're not dealing with the people that are making the decisions and they are, you know, not making the right decisions, then they need to leave the business, um, unfortunately. Um, you know, there's a process, obviously, that you would go through, but, yeah, you've got to deal with the people that are actually making the decisions. And if they're not making the right decisions, it doesn't matter what you put in place. Nothing will actually, um, nothing will change. But obviously, that's where it goes back to the inclusion piece. And it's about, you know, ensuring that person understands how this does impact on the business as a whole. And actually, if you know, the more diverse people we have, or the more range of people we have, the better our output will be. Uh, then going back to Peter's point, you know, the more money we will make, the more money we make, the safer our jobs. You know, it does go full circle. But yes, you've absolutely got to deal with the issues within the business. Blind CVs, etc. anything you want to do like that isn't going to work. Um, if you're not actually dealing with the behaviours um, in the business itself. So I absolutely couldn't agree more. Yeah, and, and also we've got to equip our line managers, right, to be able yeah. to, to handle yeah. different situations. Um, absolutely. Uh, Ali, can I, sorry, can I just jump in and add one point to Colin was saying, because it's sort of, um, uh, please bear with me, it sounds, sounds slightly off-piste, but um, I realised relatively recently that uh, the TV show Who Wants to Be a Millionaire is, is really an exercise in, in inclusive leadership. And um, I will explain. But what I find quite fascinating is somebody gets stuck with a question. Imagine that's a business question, but in this case, they get stuck with a question. And immediately uh, it's, oh, I'm going to phone a friend. But all of their friends are exactly like them. They know the same things they do. Where are the people that don't know it? And I, when I used this at the, at, the, at the last board meeting, when I was doing the inclusive leadership training for our board, I just pointed out, well, I guarantee you that there is somebody in Royal Mail right now that knows every answer to every question that's ever been asked on who wants to be a millionaire. That's all we're trying to do. Diversity is getting as many people in there as possible. And you as inclusive leaders just need to make sure you listen to the right person and create an environment where they're happy to put their hand up and say, I know the answer. 
I love that yeah. piece. And I, I'm brilliant. almost, yeah, it is, it's brilliant. And I'm almost certain that Joe, who's our head of marketing, is busy scribbling that down right now. Um, and and we'll probably copyright it actually before you have an op <laughs> before you have a chance to love it. I think it's really, it's a really simple way actually of helping to bring people on on, on the journey. Um, let's move into some kind of practical steps because I think this is again quite interesting. So if I go to the Q and A, one of the questions in response to Olivia's um, contribution actually was whether ED and I should be um, part of HR or should it be completely separate. So um, let's chuck that one out there first. Do we think that EDI should be part of HR or should we make it a separate function? Uh, Colin. <laughs> Oh, interesting question. So um, I've always sat within um, the HR department in companies, um, but at Channel 4, I don't sit in HR. I actually report to the chief marketing officer with a dotted line to the CEO. Yep. And I think it's a really interesting, um, it's an interesting move and it's an interesting position to be in. One, because I feel that I'm more actually part of the business. Yeah. People take our unit as, as being more part of the business instead of a HR kind of function. Mm -hmm. um, two, because it's within marketing, uh, if you think about diversity and inclusion, a lot of that it actually is around marketing, how you market it externally and internally um, as well. And having that dotted line to the CEO, going back to what Peter said, um, you know, that, that is, is gold because you're, you're in there straight at the top and people do take you in the organization very seriously, A, because you're outside of HR and they don't feel it's just a tick box, and two, because you're, you're um, reporting into the CEO. So I think it's very interesting to have it outside of HR. Yeah, I, sorry, Tally, I was gonna say I agree, go. Multiple, that I've, for many years, I've kind of suggested that if we want to make a sustainable difference, it needs to be out of HR. Because what a chief diversity officer or a DNI lead role does, when you sit alongside as a peer to HR, you are a critical friend. Mm -hmm. Because there are two elements to this that we've discussed already. First one is the process, the policy, the ecosystem and the infrastructure, being a critical friend and rising, helping them reshape it and look at it from a DNI lens. And then you have the application, and that's the inclusion piece, the behavior. How do we apply this from a DNI lens? And that's where the DNI, when it sits outside of HR, can then work through the organization, the ecosystem, if you think just for the catalyst of a wave. And for me, it's always that golden friend. How do we nudge that golden thread throughout the organization and the ecosystem? So when it sits outside, it will have more of an impact. And I love, Colin, to hear that it sits within the marketing and CEO office. That, for me, is a real signal of we're going to make a significant and, and substantial sustainable difference because when it sits in HR we tend and I can say this as an HR professional we tend to just put our arms around amend all the policies and the processes and then rely on our people within the business to apply it and that's all about behaviors and the, the nudges so I think if we are really going to start to take this as a business strategic objective and move forward it needs to sit outside because then it tre is treated as a PL activity. I, Olivia, I, have you seen any other um, businesses that have got DNI or I and D, depending on which way you talk about it, reporting in through marketing? I love that. Uh, yes, I have seen a few. I have seen a few, and I have, um, you know, there are a, a, a few, and, and it has been happening quite a lot this year. There are a few chief diversity officers. Uh, that are sitting outside of either marketing or HR. Um, I, I'm, oh, sorry, I'm, I'd like to just be a little bit controversial and disagree with both of those points and say that I think it does belong in HR. Um, uh, because I think that if it is, I mean, people are uh, uh, a very, very important point to your point, Tali. Uh, uh, you know, they are the lifeblood of the business. Mm -hmm. HR is that representative of the lifeblood of the business. Now, I'm not saying that HR is where it should be necessarily in all organizations, but if you take it out of HR, you're taking out a major part of what HR should be doing. If we start taking out talent, if we start taking out all the strategic elements of HR and putting them elsewhere in the business, you are reducing HR to just that process and policy policing environment, where actually, in my view, the HR leaders in my community um, and the people that we are talking to as the future leaders of HR 
um, are striving to, yes, get all of that stuff done as, you know, the operations bit, but being there and having the most important conversations within the organization about the future of their people and the capability and the skill sets and everything. And DNI is in that conversation. So I think it should be there, whether it's where it should be in there and whether HR is working where it should be in a business still needs to be looked at, but I'm going to defend the HR ownership. I'm, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to partly agree with everybody in a true <laughs> fence sitting kind of way. I, I've seen it report into the CEO, the COO. I've seen it report in through HR. I've seen it report into the corporate social responsibility function. Uh, the marketing one's a new one to me, but um, the way we are set up in Royal Mail, um, customer facing uh, DNI. Um, opportunities are huge and make a massive difference on buying decisions so I can see why that would work. I, I would say um, where does culture set? Co co the culture is all pervasive across the whole of the organization. I don't think it matters quite where it sits as long as you've got the right people listening. I've seen it work in all of them and I've seen it fail in all of them. It's the individuals in the organization and how best to make it work. Yeah, and, and and Olivia, I'm 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 kind of with with you. I I think that um, now is the time for HR to step forward. Um, but actually, I've seen I've seen scenarios where HR reports into marketing, and and yeah, that makes perfect sense. Actually, your people, your customers, your client, your outward face, your purpose should be completely collected. And whether it's HR to marketing or marketing to HR doesn't. I don't think it matters. It's about joining the dots. Um, what I must do, otherwise I should be in, in huge trouble again, is um, make sure that we actually answer some of the questions that we got asked. Um, so perhaps we could um, go, Colin, could we go with what's the most important first step to make um, when you're trying to drive an inclusion and diversity agenda? Um, the first step, I would say, is to ensure that you talk to the people of your business, um, as many of them as possible, and identify the trends. Um, and what people are saying, um, and that's what you want to focus on on first. You want to take people on a journey, um, and you can only do that by, by listening to what's going on, understanding what's going on, um, and changing some of those things that, that are an issue. Um, so I'd say the first step is to talk to the people of your business, whether that's survey, face-to-face, -face, get as much information as you can as possible, pick the top three um, issues that people are having, um, and then deal with those so that people see that you actually are taking it seriously. So the first step is talk. Yeah, really interesting. And then, and then actually what that talking can lead to is we've seen many organisations who've hired actually really diverse workforces. They've hired some great people in, but the organisation may not be ready for that diversity of thinking and then you lose great people. So actually listening to people and kind of getting the information from them first helps to bring people on the journey. Peter? Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I was just, I was agreeing. You, you need to know what the problem is that you're, you're trying to solve. And the big, the big thing is do, do small bits well and prove that you've, you've listened and you're going to do it properly, as opposed to we're going to try and fix everything, in which case nothing really gets done and people become disillusioned. And then I would go for the next second step is you take everything that you've just found out from your workforce and you take it to the most senior person you can find and say, we need to fix this because... And where do you get the because from? Uh, the because is from the people that you've just spoken to as per, per Colin's um, contribution. You need to know what it is that you're looking at and then you need to work out why it matters. And I know that sounds like a simple question. It matters because. So to whichever senior leader, whether it's through HR or however you're doing it, is we need to change this because. And this is what will happen if we do. This is what will happen if we don't. This is the impact on the business. This is how we're going to be more successful, whatever the hook is. And, um, and just generally lay out the steps. After that, you can think about how to go about fixing it. Yeah, Colin? Um, I just want to say, uh, touching on what Peter said, uh, one of the areas that I always start with are exit interviews. So I look at the exit interviews, why people are leaving the business, what's gone wrong for them. Then that then also gives you the, the story to go to the uh, board and say, this is why it's important because we've lost X, Y, Z amount of people over the last year. And this is a common trend to why people are leaving. So that, that's, I think, exit interview is a really good place to start. Yeah. To build on that, so there's so much here, there's so much richness here. You know, wonderful things happen with small beginnings. And if we keep that at front of mind, then it really kind of hooks back into what Peter was showing. 
Yeah. The one thing did really well. Colin, I love the exit interviews and I would also add entry interviews because when we do the entry and onboarding interviews, we get a sense of why you joined us. What was your experience like? That It's all about the people experience. We talk about consumer experience, stakeholder experience, shareholder experience. What is about our people internally experience? And when we start to look at the difference between onboarding, entry and leaving, what's the gap? What have we dropped? Where have we dropped the ball? And just pick one friend. Um, and once we've done all the kind of conversations and capturing, you'll get so many solutions as well from when you have these conversations because most of the solutions come from our people. Because it's their experience. And listening, listening really, and I call it devoted listening because if we listen with devotion, we tend to even pick up the small distinctions, even in this virtual world that we're in, the small distinctions of, how that one item you're going to put on the agenda to change will make all the difference for that a cohort of people in your business, your colleagues, your co-workers. Olivia. Um, I would also add on the kind of, if you've done your entry interviews, your actual interviews for new people joining your business. Um, what you tend to see, because it's easy and it's consistent, um, are the same interviewers, uh, same people interview, um, and uh, so they get a consistent set of feedback, but actually if you can uh, have a diverse set of interviewers, and I mean changing, not just constant and diverse, but people from different parts of the business, different teams, um, interviewing people, yes, you might get differences of opinion and feedback, but you will then be able to discuss those. You know, are we getting the same set of feedback? Are the same people joining because the same people are making the decision about who comes? And it speaks volumes about the strength of a culture of an organization if you can have different people interviewing um, rather than just being able to get a consistent set of feedback. So, um, you know, varying your interviews, um, encouraging more people to interview, um, giving the skills to interview technically so that you can actually get the right people skills wise in. But including more people in your recruitment process will engage them as well into you know in, in getting part of new blood uh, into into the business as well as um you know giving you a better business experience and performance potentially from having more voices can i just add to that i i so echo that because one of the things i did um in my previous organization is several years ago and when i first introduced everyone thought i was a bit quirk and you know what am i doing I want, was really, for me, was, was important is we have not only diverse pool of candidates, but a diverse panel. It doesn't help us have to be a panel interview, but even in just a one-to-one. -one. So it wasn't just about having the senior people interview. For me, what was really important, because it's a book, how do we empower our colleagues across the business? So I would invite what I would describe as more my junior members of teams, not HR, across the business to interview. And so the age diversity was so critical here because you got, that's where the reverse mentoring concepts start to really kick in in real time. And bringing that to the interview platform started to create a whole new conversation. And we started to pull out some really interesting, rich content from the candidates. And what we saw over time through the trend, through the data, we were hiring more diverse candidates and diverse thinking was really coming alive. We saw it in real time. So we would ensure we would have gender balance. We would sure we'd have ethnicity balance. We would sure we'd have age balance and seniority of job levels as well. Because we don't talk about job grades that much, you know, as part of DNI, and we should, because that's also part of the pinch point and the kinks that we need to unlock. And now part of the reason that I get in trouble and I'm rubbish at um, um, sticking time is that actually um, we could talk about this for hours. I think it's really interesting. Every time when, when we have great panellists, actually, you get great content and it's really engaging. Um, so thank you. But th that for me is too obvious a link into data for me to ignore. So um, Colin, forgive me. Uh, but I think we, we need to do it. I'm going to skip over the poll. Otherwise, I'm definitely going to be in trouble um, on, on timing. Um, this was a quote from Lisa Cole, who's People Director at Staples. Uh, the, the time has demonstrated how important HR data is, and it's time for HR to step forward. There's an opportunity to use data on every level. Tali, you've talked just then about some examples of, of how you have used data. Peter, can you um, talk about some of the things that you've done at Royal Mail? Because I think they're really interesting from a data perspective. Um, 
yes, where to start? Um, when I when I first arrived, there was a lot of anecdotal evidence. We're not very good at this. We're very good at that. We're, we're rubbish at this. We never hire those kind of people and they never get promoted. And the first thing I did was go, well, what is actually going on? So we, we've got we've got slightly different challenges at, at Royal Mail. For example, we, we're over 40 percent of women in senior leadership. We've got um, about 15 percent uh, BAME representation, dislike that phrase, but BAME representation at junior level, more than 20 percent in managerial roles. So we've got probably slightly different challenges to a lot of people. But I wanted to know what was going on, because one thing Royal Mail is very good at is hitting a target. So before I arrived, They'd set a target of 30% um, of hires should be women into frontline type roles, which they duly hit and then duly lost everybody because there wasn't an inclusive environment to make sure they were they were looked after. So I wanted to look at what was actually going on. So I started from the very beginning. How many people in the particular characteristics that I were exploring applied? How many people did we reject? How many people rejected us after a particular interaction? How many people did we hire? How long did those people stay for? Why did they leave? Did they leave for different reasons within the first month, within three months, within two years? What was the attrition rate from all of those particular things? How many of those people went on to get promoted? Do we have, um, are we better at promoting people internally or from particular characteristics or are we better at hiring them externally? It turns out we're very good at promoting them once you're indoctrinated into the raw male way of thinking we trust you to be promoted whereas when we hire people in oh you're a little bit too different you're going to say controversial things and we don't really want to have that so there's a big cultural challenge to be faced and that threw up for me a few particular anomalies so from a uh, BAME representation for example once they engaged with us they were more likely to stick around. Literally half of the people dropped out once they were engaged in the process. We also found that very few people were did ticks the prefer not to say box when it came to ethnicity. Um, and what we what we found was we were hiring huge number of applications as you're imagining we were hiring 50 percent less people from a bane population than we were from female and my other particular target was the under 30 population because we have a very very aging population at least 55 percent of our people i think are over 50 so we've got a massive cliff, a cliff edge that we need to deal with so we, we looked at all of those and uh, that, that, that then allowed me to tweak the recruitment, the attrition process. I made particular targets that were then relevant to retention and not just recruitment. Because again, being good at targets, if we gave them a retention target, they wouldn't hire anybody again, causing problems for me in a very different way. <clears throat> so what I then did was go, well, actually, we're, we are pretty close to census data from a BAME background at about 14% but I can pretty much guarantee that is not spread evenly across the whole of the organization. So where are those? So what I then did was I mapped our, our employee population by the office or the site that they worked in against the employee against the working age census data which has been broken down by individual postcode so i then came up with individual uh, attraction and attrition targets for each one of what we call sdl so we're broken down into 20 regional units around the country and i would say look you are above parity here you're below parity there you're amazingly good you don't really need to do anything apart from hold water we need to sort out this particular place so we had pockets of excellence and we worked out what was working and what was not and then I gave them obviously the tools to be successful the, the just particular tailor-made targets guides uh, about how to achieve what they needed to achieve and we embedded that into our uh, five-year strategy of where we want to be from a group-wide target perspective so data really underpinned everything that we were doing mostly because I could identify what the problems were, not just the anecdotal problems, what the actual problems were. And I could use that to show and uh, what needed to be done and drive the decision making in an actual uh, factual way. I love that. And, and I think Talia, I will, I'll absolutely come to you, but I think for me, what's really interesting is, um, yeah, coming at this commercially going, right, I, I need as much data as I can. And a whole bunch of that data is internal data. And some of it is soft and some of it is hard facts. Um, but actually, there's this also this whole world of external data where I can grab information in order to make a better informed decision. And that for me is what's really interesting about that. Tali. 
Oh, okay. I, so I did something very similar in my previous organisation and I did it globally because we had offices globally and it's incredibly powerful when you take it to the board. That That is then meaningful data. And then what I also overlaid it with is our consumers because we, we had a consumer market. Um, what I think is really important to also touch on is trust. Is collate, how do we start to collate the data? Because <laughs> having the data is great and then we can analyze it and then we can replay it and have a narrative around it and all the solutions, but how do we grab the data? How do we invite our colleagues to share? And we start back to what we discussed earlier on, engagement, conversations, the why, the how. And particularly, I'm gonna just pick on this one as an example, particularly ethnicity. It's complex, it's sensitive, people don't want to share their ethnicity. And it's just what well, I disclosed my ethnicity pay gap two years ago, and we spent quite a bit of time really working on the engagement and the why. And on the first disclosure, we had 70% response rate uh, from colleagues, which was wonderful on the first on the first occasion. But we spent a lot of time on the engagement so that we can invite and grab the data and then we can overlay and do everything that Peter beautifully articulated because the first step is the trust and that's the same with sexual orientation it is the same with disabilities and I think really working with the board and the executives but the ecosystem as I describe it to create that trust and it's all about conversations engagement and listening listening to the why yeah, and um, let me can we can I put a question at you, um, which I think is quite interesting because you look at this again, sort of across a bunch of businesses. What what are your thoughts on quotas, Colin? Sorry. Yeah, hey, I thought you said Tali. Sorry, I didn't realise you said. Sorry. No. <laughs> sorry, could you repeat the question? Yeah, what are your thoughts on quotas? <laughs> Um, <laughs> that was one of those phrases that says go to something else. I'm quite happy if you want me to just move on. <laughs> yeah, let's move on. <laughs> I'm, I'm happy, happy to, um, I'm, I'm, I'm no, happy I, to I, have I, a try on I this because I'm. Have I'm quotas, you believe you have to have targets, I do, but um, I don't think the, everything you do should be driven by that. I think if you become too focused on, on those, um, so for instance, if, if you, um, if your stats are telling you that, um, you um, you don't have enough, um, disabled candidates applying for roles, if you then just start focusing on that and everything else will then kind of drop off and you can get that stat up really quickly and really easily and then hit that quota. But what effect is that going to have on it, on everything else? Um, so I think it's important that you understand what is happening, but it's also important that whatever you do, um, or the changes you make to your to your recruitment process, um, that it's actually across the board, and that it's for every interview, and that it's consistent, and it will continue to happen. Not just change something to to change a stat and get that up, because actually it could have fundamental effect on you know another part. Um, of the recruitment process. So I think it's looking at what you're doing and creating platforms for people to succeed, driven by the data that you've got, but don't just focus on the one area that is, is highlighted. When you're looking at it, make sure that actually, this is a level playing field for, for everybody. I think that's really important. Yeah, I think that's re that's a really good answer, actually. Um, Peter, can I um, pose the question at you? Because I think this is relevant to your time, particularly at ENEI. Um, uh, and that is, which organisations did you see um, are most advanced at using data to drive the DNI agenda? Uh, and did you see a difference in the outcomes that they're realising? And you know, feel free to describe them as major retailer rather than yeah. You know, like, in in my experience, everybody has an element of data that goes goes into driving their DNI strategy. I'm not sure it's quite as simple as as using data. I don't think people always ask the right questions. To go back to Colin's point, it's always quite interesting. If you look at fixing one thing, so using his idea for disability, why are, why aren't disabled people joining? Is that the same reason why people who are black aren't joining or people who are gay aren't joining or whatever else it might be? When you focus on one, you get stuck on one. And that's the solution to that problem might be the solution to a number of different things you need to know. The data gives you that if you ask the right questions. Where I'm slightly fearful is everybody has data 
to solve the solution that they already think they want to fix. They don't tend to look at the data in the whole, I have got no idea what's right and what's wrong. I am going to be driven by this. And it's going back all the way to the beginning of the conversation, that bias creeps in. So when you go looking for data to prove what you think you already know, you're going to find it and you will always find it. And it's not going to give you the solution that you're looking for. So without naming names, the people that do it well start by saying, I don't know what the outcome is going to be. I will see what the data says and then I will come up with my solutions. I will provide a strategy. I will do all of the individual uh, interventions that need to happen in order to affect the change that is required that the data has shown us. So uh, not giving you specific examples, but that's the approach that you would really need to take. And those are the ones that do it well. I'm really interesting. Thank you for that. I'm going to, um, sorry, Tali, I'll, I'll come back to you if we have time, but um, at 9.25, I'm going to be in trouble again if I'm not really careful. Um, so I'm, I'm going to kind of take that question and say that actually, um, we think um, some of our clients are doing some quite interesting stuff through the use of external data. So um, you're right, Peter, some of them will take an hypoth a, a hypothesis um, and look at their internal data and their internal people analytics to either prove or disprove that hypothesis, which, which gives you quite a narrow frame of mind, unless you've got 20, 30, 40 different <laughs> hypotheses to prove. But actually the, the conversations that we're having with our clients now are quite interesting. And that's about how do we match our employee profile to the external marketplace to uh, our customer base uh, and potentially also also to a student base you know so i think it's quite interesting it's about saying actually our organization should be matching what we are trying to be as an organization um, whether that's the people we're trying to hire whether that's the people who work for us whether it's the people who buy from us or whether it's the people who we engage with and we want to hire in the future. Um, and so they're joining the dots between um, particularly kind of the location of diverse skills. So again, I've just pulled off some data this morning. That's quite interesting. So um, we are a technology business. Um, we have offices in London and Cardiff. And I just pulled off some data around data scientists because we have a whole bunch of data scientists. Um, and just if I literally just look at gender, let me look at nothing else. I can very clearly see that across these three different locations, the place where I am most likely to be able to turn the dial on my gender diversity in data science is in London. It's not in Cardiff. Um, if I then, and it's certainly not in Birmingham, if I kind of look at the population that's available to me. And then I went, okay, and, and, and what does this mean in terms of how and where I need to engage? with these particular sources of talent. So how can I take some actually quite specific action to say, I want to start communicating with diverse talent in the external world, where are these people? Um, and then how does that match the external environment? So Peter, this was your point about you know, the workforce data. So actually, what does the population look like? Have I got a chance? Can I reskill based on the external population? And then how attractive is that to the talent that I am trying to bring to the table? And I think this for me is where data becomes quite interesting is when you're looking at how you can join the dots between what you want to be as a business, your client base, the external environment, and, and almost then be using some of your internal data to inform how you make it happen. So you've got external data that shows you where and how you can turn the dial. And then you've got internal data that says, how do I make it happen? How do I actually make it work um, and not lose people? Colin, have you started the data journey and you know, you're eight weeks in at Channel 4, so maybe slightly early actually, but have you started the data journey? Um, yes, I have. Um, going back to, um, to what um, uh, Peter said, I didn't, um, what, I started the journey by talking to people, first of all, to find out what they felt issues were. Um, and then we're now looking at the, the data um, behind that. Um, what I found is that um, it goes back to asking the right questions. We've, we've actually got lots of data. Yes, we have. Um, is it relevant, though? Um, I wouldn't say that um, a lot of it is, because I don't feel the right questions were, were asked. And obviously those questions, you know, they, they do change, um, you know, over time. Um, but now is the point where we need to be asking different questions um, to gather that um, data. Um, but yes, we are very much looking at our, our data at the moment. 
Thank you. Now I'm on 929, so I've done it again. I'm in trouble again. Um, but if I could, we'll, we'll whiz round and perhaps either do top three actions that you could take um, or the simplest thing to drive change to increase organisation diversity and inclusion. Yeah, you know, because there was a whole bunch of stuff you can do just to change it. So, Colin, you, you're off mute, so I'm going to pick on you first, I'm afraid. So um, e either three three top tips or one thing to change. Um, I'd say one thing to change um, is uh, do a staff survey. Um, do that quarterly. Uh, make sure you have really rich questions on there around um, inclusion. Uh, once you've got those back, um, you know, pick something that you feel that you actually can achieve. Um, and do it and implement it really quickly. If you do that, people will feel that you're listening and you, you'll get them on board um, a lot easier. So it's ask, ask your people, implement something really quickly that you know that your people are saying that they want um, and then you can move on from there. Fab. Olivia, thank you. Um, I'm, I'll do top tips, but with a, a search angle, um, which is going back to the um, diversity of your panelists, so your interviewers um, across the business, and Tali talked a lot about that. And um, also with regards to data um, and what you're using, you know, in the search space, we do a lot of research into the market to find candidates who eventually we present to a client to show them their shortlist. Not enough clients asked us about our journey and who didn't want to go for it, who wasn't right, to why they weren't right, why they weren't interested. So the huge amount of data that we don't get an opportunity to share a lot of the time. Some people do ask and it's very valuable, but again, it's around what questions aren't you asking? So if you ask and you partner with suppliers who have robust processes around, uh, you know, finding um, and talking to as diverse a portfolio of, of, of candidates as they can, they'll find out an awful lot about themselves as well. I think that's only two, but they were quite long ones. <laughs> that's two and a half, entirely. <laughs> echoing a lot of this so um for me it's listen to your people talk to your people capture their insights what works well what doesn't work well um engagement service are great but you might you know focus groups as well because in real time hearing um how they share the you know igniting emotions is so important in this and then also the data but also working with your board so as Peter said, find the most senior person that you can reach out to and speak to them and start to have that conversation. I think what's really important for me, in addition to all of that, is keeping the dialogue happening. We must have the conversation because conversation ultimately then turns into actions and behaviour shift. Lovely. Peter? Uh, board sponsorship, link d &I strategy to business strategy and listen to your employees. Um, I love that. And actually, you've also picked up on something that was being said in chat, which is actually this is about uh, fundamentally linking this to your business strategy and how important the DNI strategy and the business strategy and, and how they are aligned. Um, it goes without saying that um, I am extremely grateful to all of our panelists for their time this morning. Um, uh, thank you for giving up your time. Um, once again, I know that we've had a great panel session when I've run over by a couple of minutes because it just means that the content has been so engaging. Sometimes I forget that I'm supposed to be asking you questions and I just get lost in listening. Um, so thank you very much. Massive thank you to all of you. Um, and we look forward to seeing everybody next month. Next month, we're looking at transformation, digital transformation. So um, thank you, Peter, Tali, Olivia, as ever, and Tucker Stone uh, and Colin. Thank you very much for your time. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Bye. Bye, -bye. We'll just give time for people to climb off. But Colin, thank you very much. And Tali, thank you very much. <laughs> oh, thank um, you. We've been talking about hours. There's so much content. Yeah. Uh